Uh, so first of all, it's, um, it's an honor to be here and it's a pleasure to see uh, so many uh, familiar faces and also uh, a lot of new faces. Um, I did want to give a shout out to Paul Torrens. I think it was about 18 years ago uh, when I was a, a medical student at USC. Um, you can boo if you wish. Uh, uh, fight on, right? Um, no. <laughs> I'm gonna get lynched. Uh, uh, but uh, it was about 18 years ago uh, when Paul Torrance came to USC and, and gave a um, uh, overview of health policy that kind of piqued uh, my interest as well as uh, a lot of other students in, in my cohort. Um, and it's kind of neat that here I am 18 years later uh, kind of living the dream, if you will. So I'd like to thank Paul for his influence. So um, as immediate past president of the CAFP, uh, it's a 9,000 member organization, uh, largest primary care organization in the state. Um, I had the privilege of uh, literally going as far north as Eureka and as far south as San Diego and everywhere in between and, and meet with uh, physicians on the ground doing the work. And there's a lot of um, concern, uh, particularly from small and solo practice physicians and rural physicians about the potential negative impacts of macro. Now, are they against this idea of delivering value in the care that they provide? They're not against that. What they're concerned about is the administrative burden uh, because they're not set up. They don't have the infrastructure necessarily to be able to uh, find the data that they need to report or to organize it in a meaningful way um, or to submit it in an electronic way in some cases. So um, my focus today is going to be on uh, small, small, so, small uh, and rural, rural practices. Um, I am on Twitter, so that's my uh, Twitter handle. And those are hashtags that I utilize. So if you're on Twitter and live tweeting this, uh, please give me a shout out. Um, <laughs> I will retweet you afterwards. Okay, so um, where will small, uh, uh, solo, rural, and rural practices land? Um, so, CMS is expanding what qualifies as an APM. And so I think this will help um, uh, groups over time. However, um, we still think that a lot of the small and solo practices will fall under MIPS uh, rather than, an, than under an APM. And it's largely uh, due to the a statistic that was uh, stated before that about half of the physicians don't really know what's gonna hit them. Um, and, and an example of this, I was at a county meeting and I was speaking with somebody about this time last year, actually just prior to this time last year. And if you remember last fall, what happened was ICD-10 got implemented. And I was at a meeting in September and speaking with a physician and he said to me, hey, you're the president of the CAFP. Um, can you stop this ICD-10 implementation? <laughs> and I said, you're not ready? And he goes, no, I was just hoping it would go away. And unfortunately, um, that, that is um, a little bit of the, the attitude for folks because they, truly what they're doing is they're, they're doing their best to, to crank out widgets of care, to make the health better for their populations that they serve. And um, they don't necessarily have the infrastructure or the time to work on uh, building data reporting systems um, that, that a lot of the larger groups are uh, privileged to have. So, um, What's the potential impact on practices? So as we know, uh, MACRA is intended to be budget neutral. Um, it uh, got rid of the, um, you know, the potential 23% payment cut to providers uh, through Medicare. And this um, means that positive billing adjustments must be offset by negative ones. So you get a zero sum game. Um, and um, in the proposed rule, um, the, um, the anticipated that almost 90% of solo clinicians and 70% of those in practice with two to nine, so the smolos, uh, will receive a negative adjustment. Um, so this poten potentially could exacerbate um, some of the issues that we've been seeing with giving people access to a card, um, but yet not having a provider to see because people have to keep their doors open, right? So if you're receiving a negative impact, it's gonna be difficult to keep the lights on um, and the way I like to think about that, the access issue, is um, uh, think about your UCLA parking permit. Um, it doesn't entitle you to a space, it gives you permission to hunt for one, <laughs> right? 
Likewise, uh, your insurance card uh, doesn't entitle you to be seen by anybody because if you're in a community that doesn't accept or, or has very few people that accept your card, um, guess what? You're going to be um, having a difficult time accessing care. And we certainly are seeing this. I, I was actually in Massachusetts during the implementation of Romney Care, and um, oftentimes working graveyard on Friday night, I would get um, two, in, two in the morning hypertension med refill, and I would ask, yo, what are you, what are you doing here? So I couldn't get in to see my primary for four months. Um, so I'm here at urgent care uh, to get my meds refilled. So, so this is a real issue. I, I think there's potential impacts on um, uh, access uh, because of these negative adjustments. And um, it's, it's good to see that there's been an attempt to slow down the pace of change in order for folks to kind of catch up. So that 50% that's asking the question, hey, is this macro thing really going to happen um, you know, when it's supposed to happen? Um, uh, that they're actually prepared. So uh, we think that with um, small and rural practices, um, you know, it's nice that they are, are required to perform fewer uh, clinical performance improvement activities to receive that maximum score. Um, and then as Bill mentioned, uh, there are exemptions for low volume uh, Medicare providers from the whole quality payment program. And as noted before, there's a concern, particularly among small and solo docs, about uh, moving into these larger, more integrated systems. Um, and it's, it's this sort of inherent distrust that physicians on the ground have of systems, um, because the way they've practiced medicine in their community has not been to interface with a large system. And any large system that comes through typically gobbles up a lot of the business and kind of uh, takes up all the oxygen, if you will, uh, in that area. And I certainly saw that in um, some, particularly some of the rural communities where um, in one community that I went to, uh, there were literally probably in about three years time, about 30 physicians left that area, either through retirement, um, attrition, or, um, or death. And it, it Got, it was so bad that I ended up, I, I met a vascular surgeon on his way out of the hospital and he said, yeah, I feel really bad. I, after I see a, a patient, I, I'm, I'm trying to bone up on my primary care because I feel bad trying to refer back to the primary care guys that are left in town. Um, and, and, you know, bless his heart, but uh, we need to do better, um, uh, especially when it comes to serving communities. Um, and in these low density underserved areas, I think where, where there potentially could be a real issue. So um, technical assistance is required, um, and I, I think there's opportunities not only for uh, the government to be involved in this, but I, I have a feeling there will be a lot of consulting companies that will come up, um, and technology companies that will help with um, lassoing data. And if you've worked in any sort of organization, you know that data exists in cul-de-sacs, and in these cul-de-sacs ex exist trolls who don't want to give up their data. And so... Um, <laughs> How do we uh, dissolve the trolls and access the cul-de-sacs and create an information highway that allows for us to have a flow of data? And I think that's going to be a big challenge. And again, I think there's a lot of area for uh, technical assistance. Certainly in Los Angeles County for the community health centers, uh, we've um, started to see some evidence of um, companies and, and, and IPAs that are really interested in getting community health centers to work on being able to report that data, which historically they haven't needed to do. The other is this idea of virtual groups, um, uh, which um, is this essentially idea of, uh, I guess it's called the meta group, if you will, right? Where uh, you have a, a variety of groups that may be in the area, like the small those that I was talking about earlier, um, that um, could band together um, to buy a system of reporting and share that system and that platform to be able to report to the, uh, the agencies that need that, that data. Um, and so it's a way to aggregate patient populations, to mitigate some of the, um, the ups and downs of, of data, and then to potentially also work together to work, on, work out best practices for a region uh, to be able to, say, focus on colorectal cancer screening or vaccine rates or whatever it may be. Um, there's, there's an opportunity for these virtual or meta groups to work together to, to make that happen. Um, and so it's encouraging to see that that is going to be an opportunity um, in MACRA. 
um, and to, uh, we'll see how, I guess, well the groups take, take this on as an opportunity. And again, there may be opportunities um, for consulting companies and whatnot to make that happen. Um, EHR, we know, is uh, very clunky. Um, and um, having gone from one EMR system to another in, in my job transition, I can tell you there's uh, every single one of them is clunky. Uh, <laughs> that that uh, there are, the grass is always greener, but uh, the grass is brown on whatever side you're on as well. So. Um, and so part of the issue with that is that um, the EHR platforms have uh, variability in terms of how good they are at, at being able to access and report data. And so um, can MACRA help with uh, putting the feet to the fire of EHR companies to fix their broken products uh, to be able to do that data reporting? Um, other recommendations uh, from the CAFP standpoint, uh, feedback to physicians. The original rule, I think I'm just about out of time, um, has proposed to provide feedback on an annual basis. And I'm a parent, and if I gave my kid uh, feedback once a year, <laughs> I don't think I would see improvement over time. Uh, so uh, therefore, uh, we're, we're respectfully requesting that that uh, feedback be given a little bit more frequently. And I think quarterly is reasonable. Um, it gives organizations the opportunity to analyze the data, read it, accept it, and then create action plans for moving forward. Um, and then this um, concern about uh, using primarily claims data, um, it's, a, it's a very blunt instrument. Um, oftentimes it doesn't get at, it, it's, it's something to measure, but it doesn't actually, it may not actually have uh, uh, any relation to what actually is going on, um, uh, uh, you know, at the point of care. And so there probably needs to be a blend, and I don't know what that right blend is, but um, I would say whatever measures that are out there, we need to cut, uh, and I'm borrowing from Don Berwick, we need to t cut them in half, cut them in half again, and then cut them in half again, to get down to a reasonable number of measures so that people aren't hit over the head with the red flag in the EMR about measures they need to be focused on. Here's some tools and resources. And um, I should mention that um, when looking at uh, MACRA from the community health center and rural health, health center standpoint, uh, essentially um, community health centers and uh, rural health centers will be exempt from MIPS. Um, uh, although uh, community health centers and rural health centers may have the opportunity to, to uh, submit data if they want to practice. And so, um, uh, and there are other um, activities afoot. Uh, there's a CP3 initiative uh, here in California that the California Primary Care Association has put forward with a very confusing um, similar acronym uh, as, called APM uh, that, they're, <laughs> that they're working on. Um, but it's very similar to what we're seeing in macro. So I think there's going to be a lot of movement towards this as Medicare kind of moves the vector uh, towards uh, value. So with that, I'll uh, step down and pass the mic to my, to my friend, Adam.